Just take your hymnals and turn to 278, and we'll begin this morning, 278 at Calvary. Let's stand together as we sing. see you this morning and uh, hopefully you are ready to hear the Word of God this morning uh, we'll be talking about uh, Jesus uh, being buried on the cross or after he died on the cross but a couple of announcements uh, tonight is the quarterly business meeting at 7 p.m. hopefully you've grabbed one of those facility usage policies to review and think about and pray about and then, of course, uh, this week is our normal scheduled prayer meeting at 7. Uh, we do, I do want to uh, talk about the celebration of life uh, service for uh, Janet Bigelow, or Janet Summerfield, Helen Bigelow's sister. Uh, <clears throat> is that the right date in there? August the 7th. August the 7th? Okay, yeah. For some reason, I was thinking of the 11th in my head, but it must have been, a, it's 11 a.m. is the service. So uh, August 7th, I'll be planning that, write that down, and uh, I think that's everything we needed to mention officially, but uh, we've had some students been going to Camp Michael. Uh, my boys were there last week, and there's going to be some uh, more kids going this week. I think uh, Evelyn, uh, Briley, and uh, uh, Elizabeth Cheney as well. And I, I don't know if any more have gone that I don't know about, but uh, so we have a few more students gonna be there this week, so they go uh, tomorrow morning. So if you think about it, pray for those young ladies this week here there at Camp Michael. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we, Praise you for being so good to us, so kind to us, Lord, giving us, uh, extending to us so much grace and love and forgiveness. Lord, we're thankful that you don't just throw us into the pit of hell the first time we sin, Lord. Uh, you could do it. You are a holy and perfect God and who created the universe, Father. We're thankful that you are so kind to us. Father, we do lift up some of these prayer requests that we heard about in Sunday school class. We think of Dick Ludwig, and Lord, we know that uh, he is fading, uh, going uh, to be with you soon. We just pray for his family, give them strength and encouragement. Lord, we think of uh, John's family with his aunt Sydney getting this very, very serious cancer diagnosis with uh, perhaps one month to live. 
We just pray that you would guide and direct that family. Lord, if there's some kind of a treatment that would help her, but uh, Lord, whatever your will is in that area, we submit to you. And uh, Lord, there's other prayer requests that have been mentioned, some unspoken, some things we've heard about, some things we're praying for in private. Lord, I'm thankful that you listen to us every day. And, and Lord, as we hear from your word today, help us to uh, submit to you and what you would have us do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In your hymnal, 260. <laughs> Now, 
I will say that I'm glad I mentioned something to Pastor this morning because I was going to read out of Luke instead of John. So our scripture reading this morning is uh, John, not Luke, John uh, 19, sorry. <laughs> John 19, uh, verses 38 through 42. So when you find that, if you can stand up for me, please. All right, let's begin. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. <clears throat> Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Thank you, may be seated. Have the ushers come forward for offering, please. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everyone that was able to make it. We pray that the money that is given today will honor and glorify you, not only in the mission field that we support, but also right here in North Branch in our community. We pray that you watch over us, guide us. We pray all this in your name. Amen.
I'm rushing to get up here fast because my sermon today is really extra long and I want to make sure I have enough time. Uh, but uh, we left off last week with Jesus hanging on the cross. There was the three hours of darkness. Uh, there was the earthquake. There was all the things that were going on. And Jesus said, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit and he is dead. Uh, now it's time for him to be buried. So grab your Bible, find Luke 23. We're going to start reading in verse 50. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, uh, or as John said, Arimathea. I don't know what's right. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. A uh, city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock. There was no one that had ever laid there before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant, fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. If you would, uh, bow your heads one more time. I just want to ask the Lord to really give us a special blessing this morning. Lord, we love you and thank you for your gracious love that was proved to us when Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross. Lord, personally, I'm so thankful that I'm even here today with all the sins I've done in the past. I probably don't really deserve to be on this stage, but Lord, I'm thankful that your grace is greater than all my sin. Lord, I'm thankful that the price you paid on the cross is greater than any mess that I've made. Lord, help us all to see that today, maybe perhaps more clearly than we've ever seen it before. Father, I think as I studied for this message, as I read and wrote things down, I'm, I'm convinced, Father, that this message is a special message. I know that your spirit is present in this room today, desiring that all of us take steps forward in our faith. Lord, I know that your word is alive and active. So I pray right now that hearts would be softened. And Lord, that you would work in spite of, in spite of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Burial and funeral traditions are different all over the world. Wherever you go, you see different things. Even in the U.S., they're different from region to region, from state to state. Say a place like New Orleans, that is a funeral procession right through town. That, that's a dead lady there. Julie's got this look on her face. They have her propped up in a casket and they're having a party dragging her through town. Can you imagine seeing something like that rolling through North Branch? You would never see anything like that here, would you? Because our traditions are, are much, much different. Even in the past, say you go back 100, 150 years ago, uh, burial and funeral traditions were much different. For instance, rarely today do families get shovels and start putting shovelfuls of dirt on top of the casket. Whereas a long time ago, they get handfuls and throw it in or a shovel. And, and it's still common uh, throughout the world, but we just don't do that here anymore. The Jewish people, though, have a very specific funeral tradition and burial traditions. <laughs> And what they do today is essentially the same way that they've been doing it for thousands of years. A family member takes the body, carefully washes the body, 
they would wrap it in a white linen shroud. And today they're buried in an unfinished pine coffin. I've seen it many times. No stain, no paint, it's just a plain pine box. The family has to do everything. They, they wash the, the, the deceased, they dress the deceased, they place them in the casket. It's very ritualistic to the Jews. It's very important to get this burial process right. Like I say, they've been doing it this way for thousands of years. However, in ancient times, the time of Jesus, the time we are talking about, if you even touched the body, even for burial preparations, it would make you ceremonially unclean. And that's important to bring up because the day Jesus died, John read it and we saw it in Luke, that was preparation day. They were preparing for the Passover feast because it was Passover time and the Jewish religious leaders, they didn't want those people left on the cross, did they? So they uh, wanted them down. They go to Pilate and they say, you need to get these guys down on the cross, break their, uh, off the cross, break their legs, because sometimes they would last for two or three days struggling for breath. So Pilate says, go ahead, break the legs, do what you gotta do. And there was this massive sledgehammer that they would pick up and they would break the legs. And they did it to the thieves, but when they got to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. Now we know from some of the places in scripture that one soldier took a spear, made sure. At this point, the bodies would be taken off the cross, probably by uh, that same group of Roman soldiers that put them on there, and they would just toss them into the Jerusalem garbage dump. But I want you to see that the leaders, those Jewish religious leaders, they are so insistent. You need to get these guys down so that we don't break our Jewish laws. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that phrase, they are worried about breaking Jewish laws. Doesn't that seem kind of hypocritical? Because how many laws did they break to kill Jesus? I mean, they arrested him in the middle of the night, not out in public during the day. They had all these illegal trials all through the night, six of them. Really, they're supposed to be during the day. They're supposed to be public. He's supposed to have representation. I mean, Jesus at any point could have said, I'm not talking. I need a lawyer. This is an illegal trial. Keep going down the line. I mean, there was much more illegal things that happened. Uh, uh, it was a uh, it was a unanimous vote. Did I ever bring this up before? It was a unanimous vote. All the members of the St. Legion that showed up, they all voted to convict Jesus of death. The Mishnah and the Torah talk about if there's ever a unanimous vote, it means they lack mercy and the case needs to be thrown out. Additionally, uh, it, all capital cases were to be deliberated a minimum of three days. I mean, we could just go on and on. Everywhere we turned, everything about this was against the law. But, but get these bodies down because Passover. So hypocritical. It was about 3 p.m. when Jesus died and the Jewish religious leaders wanted the bodies down before 6 p.m., which was the official start of the Passover. Once again, it just boggles my mind. They are worried about ceremonial law, not realizing that they just murdered Jesus, which breaks what law? One of the Ten Commandments, one of the ten most important laws. But no, let's worry about ceremony. But well, we've already mentioned this, already read this. When the soldiers get to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. I mean, these soldiers could look at the person. They, they've done this thousands upon thousands of times. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dead bodies they've seen. And uh, they just looked at him and they immediately knew he was dead. This is all routine to them. I mean, when you see enough death, you know when someone's dead. Throughout history, different people have come along and said, well, you know, Jesus wasn't really dead. He was just in a coma. 
And when they took him off the cross and, and they put him in this tomb, it was a nice, cool uh, limestone rock and, and there was a high humidity in there and, it, and they had him wrapped up in those bandages and, and uh, it helped him recover. And he revived while he was in the tomb. And no, Jesus isn't in a coma. He is dead. The soldiers knew it. He's not lifting himself up and down, trying to breathe like the other thieves. And then they put this spear in his side. I mean, Joseph and Nicodemus, when they took him off the cross, they knew he was dead. Uh, the soldiers knew he was dead. That's why they didn't break his legs. Additionally, we didn't read this out of John 19, but the Apostle John was there. He watched the entire thing, and he saw Jesus was dead. Listen to these verses, John 19, 34. It says, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you might believe. It's kind of an elaborate way but to say it, but John is saying he was there. He saw Jesus die. Look at Luke 23, verse 55. The women, they're also there watching. Now, Pete, I was considering making a joke here. <laughs> you know the joke I'm saying? Uh, do sometimes women watch what men are doing to make sure they're doing it correctly? That ever happened? Thanks for being honest, right? It happens sometimes. Uh, obviously, they're stunned. They're heartbroken. Now, remember when I talked about earlier the coma theory? The, the fancy theologians that are trying to deny the deity of Christ, they actually call that the swoon theory. It's kind of just stupid. You know, another theory that people have proposed? They say on Sunday morning when the women went back to the tomb on Resurrection Sunday and they saw that Jesus wasn't there, these people say, well, you know, the women went to the wrong tomb. Anyone want to guess what they call that theory? Anybody really bold? What do they call that theory? John, you have the notes. <laughs> say it, John, say it. Isn't that, that's really technical, theological, isn't it? The, the women went to the wrong tomb. They call it the wrong tomb theory. Uh, <clears throat> this verse is why this theory doesn't make sense. The women were there while Joseph and Nicodemus were taking care of the body and preparing it for burial. They saw the tomb where he was laid. They knew exactly where Jesus was buried. That theory kind of gets thrown out the window. There's one more theory just really quick. Uh, while the tomb was empty on that Sunday morning, listen to Matthew 27. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, so he died on a Friday, so Saturday uh, night after 6 p.m., the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how the deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and then say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went away and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So this third conspiracy theory that often gets thrown around once again, another highly technical name. Anybody want to guess? The stolen body theory. Okay. And uh, they've been saying these things. People have been throwing out all these things sort of grasping at straws because they don't want to believe in an all-powerful God that can do miracles. 
Jesus was in a coma, you revived in the tomb, and he walked out, or, you know, the ladies went to the wrong tomb, that's why it was empty, or this one, you know, someone stole the body. There's even this elaborate thing I just read about the other day where they say that the disciples tunneled through the back of the hillside or the back of the mountain from the other side, but it was in solid limestone. This is not possible, right? Nobody stole the body. I mean, some of these things are the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. I mean, these disciples that walked away from Jesus, they ran away, they abandoned him. What are they going to do now if they steal this body? I mean, furthermore, if they stole the body, everything they were teaching and saying about Jesus would have been a lie. I mean, all of them except John die a martyr's death. Would you die for a lie? I mean, as you were being killed, wouldn't you just say, hey, guys, just kidding, we stole the body 30 years ago. And this stolen body theory is just ridiculous. Besides, the disciples, they thought he was dead. They knew he was dead. They heard from John that, that he saw him die. I mean, at this point, they're all sort of going their separate ways. They don't have any hope. They heard that Jesus was stripped, humiliated, beaten, and hung on a cross. And when you're hung on a cross, what does that mean? You're cursed by God. The disciples aren't going to go back and tunnel through the hillside and steal Jesus. Some of them had already made arrangements to go back to their old jobs. Except for two guys. One completely unknown at this point. We've never even heard of him before. No one even knew he was a follower of Christ. Out of nowhere comes Joseph of Arimathea. He walks up to Pilate and he asked him permission to take Jesus' body down off the cross. Now we need to remember that Joseph is a member of the Sanhedrin. That's the Supreme Court of Israel. Now, all four Gospels mention him, so he's a very important guy. Apparently, when the entire body of the Sanhedrin voted to convict Jesus, he must not have been there. Either he wasn't invited, or he's like, I'm not going to participate in this, and left. But sometime in the last three years, Joseph had believed in Jesus. He had committed his life to him. And he had become a follower of Christ. He listened to Jesus. He was convinced uh, that he was God. So John says that Joseph kept this a secret. Secret disciple. Wealthy member of the Sanhedrin. If the Jews found out, he'd be an outcast. So he kept it all a secret. Now typically when we talk about a secret follower of Jesus Christ, the scriptures... That's not good, right? In the Bible, we know that's not good. We're not supposed to keep our belief in Jesus a secret. There's lots of verses we can go to about that. Uh, Romans 1.16 comes to mind. I am not ashamed, right, of the gospel of Christ. We're not supposed to keep it a secret. Another place is Jesus' own words in Matthew 10. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. But after these three hours of darkness, the earthquake, the veil, the ripping, after Joseph listened to the things Jesus said, the way he died, Joseph can no longer keep this a secret. And as he marched into Pilate's headquarters to ask for custody of the body, he makes a public stand for Christ. There's a verse here I want you to see. It really, to me, brings out what's going on in his heart. Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. For Joseph, there was no more secrets. 
He had decided in his heart that he was not going to let Jesus' body be thrown in the garbage dump. Now I want you to notice this, and it's a thought. Maybe you won't like the thought. Uh, maybe you'll think I'm a little crazy, and it won't be the first time someone thought I was crazy. But I see this. Joseph is led by God to seek custody of the body of Jesus. And we don't see anywhere else that anyone else was stepping up to do it. Nobody else was volunteering to do it. No one else was going to do it. You know what I thought of? Isn't ministry at church sometimes like that? Sometimes you do the thing that needs to be done because no one else volunteers to do it. And what Joseph and Nicodemus were about to do, it's not like it's a pleasant thing. This is a very dirty deed, uh, removing Jesus' mangled and torn body from the cross, meticulously washing him and finally wrapping him in this traditional linen cloth, putting fragrances between each layer, uh, about a hundred pounds worth. The only two people to step up were Nicodemus and Joseph. Now you might be wondering, well, what about the disciples, that those other 12? Well, it's only 11 now because Judas is gone. What about Peter? What about James? What about John? I mean, where, where's Andrew at this point? Where, where's the rest of those men? That's a good question. The only two people to stand up were these two guys, relatively new followers of Christ. And they take charge and they do what needs to be done. And we see in all the Gospels that Joseph is very rich. He'd be a billionaire by today's standards. He's well established in the community. He is connected uh, with all sorts of businesses and, and people. He's influential. The question might also come up, why would he risk this now? Why would he come forward now? I mean, Jesus is dead. Why is he coming out of hiding now? Nicodemus is also a very rich guy, and in John 3, we learn that he is the highest ranking teacher in all of Israel. I mean, Joseph and Nicodemus, they could have taken a step back and said, ah, it didn't work out this time, sort of chalked it up to a misjudgment or a mistake or, or whatever. <clears throat> Yet they both come forward publicly and identify with Jesus. Folks, do you see how crazy this is? Why would they do this? It's political suicide. It's corporate suicide. Because of what they're doing right here, all of their business connections would be immediately severed. As well as their religious connections. Both of these guys are going to immediately be kicked out of their church, their synagogue, where they attended their families would be removed. I mean, I've heard of being kicked out of church for unrepentant, you know, moral failures, but being kicked out of church because you buried somebody? I mean, that doesn't seem like a legit reason. But the Jews had determined that any follower of Christ would be kicked out of the synagogue. It's John 9.22. They'd agreed if if anyone confessed that he was Christ, they would be put out of the church. By the way, that also means that all the disciples and their families had already been kicked out of their synagogues. The 70, you remember there was the 12 and then there was the greater, larger group of 70, all of them kicked out of their synagogues. Now Joseph and Nicodemus, they're also going to be kicked out. Yet they had decided that they were going to stop keeping secrets. The cost of losing everything apparently no longer mattered to them, even though Jesus is dead. They don't care. They are going to let everyone know that they were followers of Jesus. No more secret discipleship, no more fear, no more sneaking around, no more hiding in the shadows. They had decided all of the stuff that they were sort of chasing after, uh, building all this wealth in life, making all these business connections, none of that mattered anymore. 
The only thing that mattered to them was Jesus. My friends, what we're seeing here is Joseph and Nicodemus, they're going all in. They're going all in. Naturally, the question for us to consider this morning would be, what about you? As I read the passage, I have to ask the same question about myself. What about me? Are we keeping things about Jesus secret? Are we secret disciples? An interesting observation is that we know the whole story. We have the complete revelation of God. The Bible is finished. We can read about it. We know that just a day or two after this, in hours, you know, a third day, Jesus came back to life. We know that on Sunday morning, he wasn't in the tomb. Joseph and Nicodemus didn't know that. They hadn't seen Christ alive. Yet they decided no more keeping secrets. What about you? Are you a secret disciple? Pastor, I'm not a secret disciple. Everybody knows I go to church. Well, I think that's pretty easy. Tell people, oh, I go to church. That's, that's simple. Does anyone know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? I think those two things are a little bit different. Oh, I go to church versus I'm a born-again believer. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. You remember that time that the disciples, Jesus had been talking, that rich man came to him and, and they were asking him questions afterwards and they said, you know, can a rich man be saved? Anybody remember what Jesus said about that? Remember that? What did Jesus say? It's more difficult for a rich man to be saved than for a camel to go through an eye. I think I heard it. Yeah, that's what Jesus said. Well, friends, right here, we see that with God, it is possible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. For both these men. They just had to deny themselves and follow Christ. They had to love Christ more than money or political connections, even more than family and friends. I think we're already well aware that this move is going to cost Nicodemus and Joseph a lot. Has following Christ ever cost you anything? You know, sometimes if you tell the truth, as stated in the Bible, sometimes you just talk to somebody and you just tell them the truth, not my own opinion, just something that the Bible says, it's going to cost you. Sometimes standing up for what's right is going to cost you. Sometimes standing and sticking up with Jesus will cost you. This, from an earthly standpoint, is going to be very costly for Joseph and Nicodemus. <clears throat> They're going to get kicked out of their, their church where they grew up going for years and for years. Folks, if you don't like me or something going on here at First Baptist Church, what are your options? What are your options? Anyone? Fire you. Fire me, yeah. You can, you can come to the business meeting tonight and make a motion from the floor. Let, I want to fire the pastor. What else? What are your other options? Go somewhere else. Leave. There's all kinds of options if you don't like something at church. If you're disciplined. If you're disciplined at church, you can go find another one. Or not go at all. If you don't like the church's uh, Bible teaching, go somewhere else. If you don't like their style of music, you can do something else. If you don't like the pastor's classes, you, you can go somewhere else. You can go find another church. It's not a big deal. You know, if the auditorium's too hot or if it's too cold, if you found a spot of mildew in the basement, what do you do? You go to another church. You go somewhere else. And if they don't give you what you need or what you want, what do you do then? You go to another church. And the cycle can continue indefinitely. 
I tried to look it up within 20 miles of here. There's at least 20 Bible-believing churches, maybe more. We have lots and lots of options. In ancient Israel, you wouldn't have those options. If you were kicked out of the synagogue, you were kicked out for real. If you're kicked out of First Baptist Church uh, on a Sunday, what are you going to do on Monday? You're going to go to work, you're going to pay your bills, your life would go on. Not in Israel. If you're kicked out of church, all business dealings that you had would cease. You are done. Your family would disown you, and there would be a massive price to pay to follow Jesus. We see Joseph and Nicodemus, they paid it. What price do you pay? You know, I was thinking about that question. There's some people that won't even give up sleeping in on Sunday mornings for their afternoon plans. It's not worth it to them. Others won't stand up in their relationship and lovingly state the truth that is clearly in the Word of God. That's just too big of a price, Pastor. I can't do it. And here we have Joseph and Nicodemus throwing away everything. It's more important for them to honor Christ, to love Jesus, than anything else. Anything. Uh, I listened to some sermons this week, and I heard one pastor say this. He said, commitment to Christ is not measured by what comes easy or costs us nothing. <clears throat> and I kind of like that. You know, last Sunday we had 56 people here, and I was thinking about some of the people that were missing. I was praying for them. And I was thinking who could have been here last Sunday, and easily we could have been we could have been pushing 80. And that's our pre-pandemic number. Class, our commitment to Christ is not measured by what comes easy or cost us nothing. You know, it's coming at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, giving a little bit in the offering plate or perhaps volunteering once in a while in a ministry, is that really, is that really too much? Especially when you think about what Joseph and Nicodemus did. Is being open about your faith in Jesus Christ, is that really too costly? Or how about this one? Is it really too difficult to love and forgive someone in your family or your church family? You might say, well, yes, it is. It is for me. Well, I would say, well, it's not nearly as difficult or costly as what Joseph uh, did, going to Pilate, getting Jesus' body down off the cross. I guess the question, the idea, and the text that's worth preaching on, it, it, the best way I can think to put it is, do you follow Christ unless? Do you follow Christ unless it interferes with fill in the blank? I mean, you have to fill in the blank. It could be, I follow Christ unless it interferes with fun, or unless it interferes with my hobbies, or unless it interferes with sleep, or unless it interferes with this relationship. I, I don't know. What could it be? How many more things are more important than faithfully following Jesus Christ? I mean, Nicodemus and Joseph, they decided that day that nothing was. I was listening to a really good friend of mine, his sermon on Luke 23. He was actually my youth pastor when I was growing up at, in Vassar. He said this, If you cannot give Christ what you love the most, what you love most will never be Christ. I like that one too. Can you see 
Joseph and Nicodemus taking Jesus' body off the cross, carefully washing it, lovingly wrapping him up in linen, as the Jews are making plans to immediately sever all ties with them. Will there ever come a day in our lives when we say, I don't care what it costs me? Because Christ is the most precious treasure there is. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, such a powerful text, especially when we bring in John and Mark and Matthew and we get this total picture that you had for us to know about Joseph and Nicodemus. Lord, I'm thankful for these two men that are great examples for us about laying it all on the line no matter what it costs, not keeping it a secret anymore. What an example for us, a powerful example for us. And Lord, uh, give us the strength we need this week to be open and honest and about our faith in Jesus Christ, to give us the strength and encourage our hearts to follow you no matter how much it costs us. Lord, big Big questions. Lord, we're going to need your spirit to help us. Really big deals, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to get together here at church, and I'm thankful for my church family, the fellowship that is, is present here, the, the heart of love that I've been seeing more and more and more often. Lord, I'm thankful for my friends, and church family. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together and turn to 287. <coughs> Excuse me, 287. Tonight, church at six, business meeting about seven. See you later. <laughs>